what was the takeaway? What are some of the things that you think are the most things to take away from this interview or that you might have learned in this interview? Well, I think for most people, it's going to be that you empathy isn't bad as, as long as you understand the biology of your animal and what it really needs and what caring about that animal really means. And that, um, you know, you should always try and, and, and do the best you can for our animals and not just see them as rocks, but realistically look at how they utilize their habitat. And like you kind of said, kind of not just see it through their eyes, but like try to imagine how they use their life. Where do they want to find their food? How are you setting up their cage for them to sleep, feel safe, and then explore and, you know, stretch their arms out and build their muscles and be the animals that they are, not just have them. So we, we talked about how to learn how to do that better. The possibility yep. of how to do that better was some of the Absolutely. conversation. Okay, so audience, tune in for that. And, All right, well, hey, and <laughs> for the audience, freaking put in comments what you think about Brian McVeigh or something. I'll right. I'll do some other shit here. But there I, you go. Everybody say how so happy I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell no, us absolutely. how at the end of this, hopefully you'll uh, do a little summary of what either you've learned or what you've taken away from this, and I'll put it as the intro. Sounds good. Kind of thing. So yeah, people, you just let me know, man. And then we'll, we'll see what I there. remember by the end of it. My brain's my brain's spaghetti. Oh, dude, I was actually I was about to say uh, I finished your retic lounge video. Yeah. And I'm in the lab, so and I'm doing something that's super messy. And this is why I can't like I have to have podcasts or something playing in my ear. Because my brain is literally chaos. And we were talking about this on that episode with uh, what, how to deal with people that you may not like. Because yeah. he did have a little different, one of the guys. And so it's literally, so my lab, super messy stuff. So I can't touch my phone. Your episode ends. And within less than 30 minutes, I figure out the only two things in this world that are possible for common sense in, in, in a 24-hour period that everybody in the around the world would have common sense of is pooping and pissing. Possibly pissing, but pooping, that's it. There is nothing else, and we need to look at it as nothing else for one reason. That way you're always asking a question to figure out what somebody else is on that topic instead of just going, well, it's common sense. It's just common sense. <laughs> like, like, no, there's – is he pooping? Then it's, it's not common sense. <laughs> and no. you actually do actually i was talking to a guy and he was like no that's not correct like that's that's how does that like work I'm like no you actually have to go back to baby and every as the more we got into it the more you realize that you have to go younger and younger and younger to figure out the common sense and it's like well cars are fast so people should recognize that you don't walk out into the street in front of a fast car no, because somebody in this world may not actually have ever figured out that a car exists. Right. So it's it's not common sense. It's, it's weird, but it, I did. like, And that's why I have to have podcasts and stuff in my brain. I have to have something listening, something working. I get you. It does. It's, it's fascinating. So we'll uh, – I've got a lot of things we can talk about. A lot of things. So we might, <laughs> I might have to have you on again to do something different, but uh, we'll have to get in a little bit of lighting, a little bit, because mainly this bit. is psychology we're trying yeah. to work on here for lots of actual reasons, and we'll get into that. And so, um, why don't you introduce yourself? So I'm Ryan McVeigh. I'm the owner of VivTech, uh, co-owner, me and my wife are owners of VivTech products. Um, and we are the first company in the world to launch UV LED lighting. Um, and one of a couple of companies that have done that now. And, uh, and no, we're just big reptile enthusiasts that have been in this industry for a very long time. I've met you several times. And when I had Bill Strand on, 
I explained that him and you, you, you can measure a man by how he treats somebody that can't do a damn thing for him. And you both are just phenomenal people. You're actually super approachable where there's a lot of people that aren't. And you guys are, and you're just an absolute treasure of a person. And I, I don't know anybody that actually hates you. I have, I know people have questions about your products, but no, like nobody hates you. So, um, I how try to keep my head, try to keep my head up and keep my hands clean. Absolutely, and you do a hell of a job. And I'm sorry, I know I I, uh, I talk to you at the shows, and I know I can be a little annoying, but you know, I'm <laughs> sorry. Hey, look, I just feel bad when I gotta be like, I gotta go, I gotta go talk to people. Hold on, I'll be right back. <laughs> no, I never get upset over that ever. Like that's that's life. That's if yeah. you're getting upset over that, you got some stuff to work out <laughs> in yourself, uh, not the other person. Yeah. <laughs> it's like no, so all good. Hey, it's good to have some company to chat. Yeah, so how I start these things out, we were wanting to have Bill Strand on for lots of good reasons, but that, or Bill Stewart, Bill Stewart, Stewart and yeah. uh, he's busy as shit. I don't know how that guy does. <laughs> he's a super busy guy, yeah. He, only uh, sleep a couple of, I've, does I've, he only I've sleep lived a couple, a does he have a genetic life. condition? He, he's, he, I have, a, I lived a very similar life to what Bill's do. It got on his plate now. So I, I know that life well, and I know exactly how busy he is. So, uh, how I start these out is I'm testing for the individual, their creativity and their empathy. And th this is a legitimate study. I'm going to put it, make a, uh, summary towards the end of it out of everybody. And I've had some wonderful people on, so it's been fascinating at what people have been missing. And we'll talk about that a little later on because I have a lot of questions. Um, I watched your interview with Curly Hair, uh, mm -hmm. where she uh, funded for U.S. Art Florida. And uh, you were talking about uh, anthropomorphizing. And yep. we will get into that towards the end of this. So let's, I have people tell a story, then tell a story about their creativity, and then we go into empathy questions. So just tell us the story. There, the just, only rule to this is be as detailed as you can. That is I don't, about anything. There is nothing off limits. Just be as detailed as you can. Yeah. Wow. My brain just went flatlined. I, um, underst I understand. Yeah. Well, uh, while you're well, doing that for sure. a second, I actually last night got my gecko. He goes, the gecko. He's a Peter Bandit skink. I have named the gecko. He finally ate. Good. He's been sickly, but he's finally ate. He actually tries to jump like he's a gecko. I've got video of him doing it. So I've named him the gecko. And he's a Peter Bandit skink, so he doesn't succeed. <laughs> but he tries. Right. So no, what do you got? Well, all right. Well, <clears throat> man, I had one. How about... All right. So... <laughs> One of my favorite memories that I have with me and Erica is uh, it was a couple of years ago. I don't remember exactly which year. We went down for Christmas Crock Fest, uh, and it was held in, or outside of Tampa. So we were south, kind of down towards into the Everglades. You know, nice and nice and warm weather. And when we landed. Uh, we went to get our rental car and they <laughs> tried to put me in this tiny, tiny little thing. And I, and I looked over, there was a Jeep and I was like, all right, how, how much realistically to get the Jeep. Um, and it wasn't much more. So we, they upgraded us to that and thank God, cause I had something in mind and I knew where I wanted to go and that little car wasn't going to hack it. I needed four wheel drive. Um, so, uh, we ended up spending a lot of time while we were down there outside of the, of Crockfest heading down to, uh, down into some warmer areas. And there was all these, um, preserves and we were driving around and, and, and flashing our, uh, our lights and counting alligators out in these channels and tons of invasive fish. Every pillar of every bridge was covered in placostomus and there were schools of Oscar down there. And, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of crazy. And we ended up going down this one trail and we had taken the top off the Jeep and Erica was sitting up on the top and I was driving and she was shining because I was making sure with, like I had tall grass and I could only see in front of me. I couldn't really see up there. And uh, we ended up 
going into the water and, and it looked like it was just a little puddle and I could keep going. And then it eventually got to the point where I was driving while looking out the window, making sure that the water wasn't going to get up into the doors or up into the engine because it had already covered up the floodlights and the floodlights were underwater, helping me see if there were any rocks I was going to hit. And, and while she sat up on top and she's like, Oh my God, I just saw a siren. Oh my God. I just saw one of these. Did you see that thing? And I'm just <laughs> sitting there driving. Just trying not to sink us. I'm like, nope, I didn't see anything except the water. Um, but no, that was that was fun. That was a, a super fun night, and we got to see a ton of cool stuff. She saw most of it. Uh, and then I did get us onto land and backed up, and we had to go back through it to get out. But we got out, and we made it <laughs> without sinking a rental Jeep. And that was super fun. There was all these channels and ponds with just tons of alligators, and you could see all their eyes. And, you That's know, cool. we get to some spots where, like, the water we were in, they were kind of up in that area. So they were only like five feet out the door of the Jeep sitting there in the water next to us. We kind of like tried to troll past them and then they'd take off. Like it was, it was really, really, really cool. And it was a really, really fun night. That's cool. What is she calling a siren? So down there, they like the sirens are, are, are amphumas or like a, it's a, it's a fully aquatic amphibian that basically has mm -hmm. like, front legs and that's it and they look like a long eel that's cool yeah, and, yeah. yeah. That, Did, that was something i really wanted to see and she got to see it in the water oh. while she was on the roof and i didn't see anything so i, I got totally i got stuck did it did it have a snorkel on the jeep no this was a factory oh. factory that's why i was watching out the window and listening because <laughs> yeah. i was the exhaust and i'm like uh, i'm waiting to hear glug 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 glug, glug and i'm yeah. like okay we're we're a little underwater but we're okay you know and waiting for like all right the intake's probably right there so i can probably get up to here before i'm gonna try not to get it to the doors like i'm watching the doors and making sure yeah it was i was doing the tactical part of this and she <laughs> was doing the. there's one of those oh my god i just saw an owl oh there's this thing over here it was That's... so she had a great time yeah i bet yeah um <laughs> what's the uh most creative thing that you that you've done i i don't know i've done a lot of different things you and yeah you tell me what because i i wanted i want to see what you think of creativity what's what it means to you there's so many different things i mean i've been into i've done a ton of different art i've been creative in that type of a way uh um, I have an engineering background and I enjoy designing and even in the engineering stats, like type of way, there's art there and there's creativity and problem solving. And, you know, there's so many different yeah. ways to be creative. Like most of where I land in creativity comes in my engineering, logical problem solving, thinking outside of the box, even when it comes to, I would say my biggest creative side is my, how I look at husbandry and how I look at how animals live. And I mean, that's something that I get told a lot that I think a lot differently about that perspective and, and how, how we care for them. We've had a lot of those conversations and I, I have a, a different perspective than a lot of the other people that I've spoken with in okay. the past. That's actually helpful. So, uh, this is the empathy questions. So tell me, put yourself in one of your animal's shoes and tell me their emotional state throughout the day and what they're doing. Like, look through their eyes. Well, any animal being that, being that uh, you know, we have good lighting in ours and all the UVA and UVB they need, I know that we get some serotonin. So if I was going to pick them and I know a, a group of animals, my, my peacock monitor is my off of bird guy, I have very scheduled animals. So I know exactly when they're going to get up, exactly when they're going to be basking. And I know what time I got to feed them by or they won't eat. If I feed them too late, they won't come back out and eat. And I know what time that is. And they're incredibly scheduled. Um, and a lot of that has to do with just, you know, natural or the way that they're set up and the lighting and, and all their parameters. But I would like to say that when my animals wake up in the morning and they come out of their, their, their hides, their burrows, whatever, um, the peacock monitors come out of their court tubes, that they see the light that is hits them and gives them a sunny day, gets them their brain moving. Um, and, and I boost their serotonin, right? So hoping that they would feel not scared, 
but inquisitive, curious, and I see that when I watch them. So I hope that I get. I hope that that's what they're feeling because it's definitely what it looks like. Um, and then they climb out and they bask and they relax. And uh, through some of the cameras that we have, we're able to watch them do that. Um, and I believe that they feel calm. They don't. They're not in a threatened stance. They're not in a in a in a. They don't look in any way like they're kind of in fight or flight. So they're pretty relaxed. And I'd like to think that they're relaxed and comfortable and enjoying their day on a beach like I would be, you know, swinging in a hammock, just thinking about stuff. And uh, and then throughout the evening, they kind of pumpkin out. Erica, my wife, says pumpkin time. They hit a time where they just turn back into pumpkins and they're just asleep. That's it. There's just, just, a, just a dead right there, like four o'clock, boom, sleep. And they all kind of go to bed. Um, I think they have a pretty cool life. I think that they do. I, I try my best to make sure that they do. Um, but I do also think that we as, as people and, and, and keepers have a substantial way to go before we can really provide them with the life that I think I want them to have. I do notice that my Savannah monitors, even as babies, they, they do stop eating at some point. Like if there's overabundance of food, they don't just gorge themselves. Yep. Whereas my bearded dragons, absolutely. Yeah. My male, the, the, my the zebra skinks and the male Peter Bandit skinks. Kind of, the male Peter Bandit skinks, kind of. I've got one male zebra that doesn't gorge itself. Yeah, they oh, definitely yeah. own a lot of those animals. That's kind of, but that's also how they they're 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 mentality their biology is made like you're talking animals that don't see that much food in the wild so if they do happen upon that much food their their mental triggers their subconscious trigger is eat and eat and eat and eat and then we provide them with that trigger multiple times and then that's where animals end up getting fat but most animals will won't like like a lot like well, i remember when i was younger they'd say with the goldfish if you feed your goldfish too much it'll eat until it literally just pops and dies and not really more likely you kill it for a million other reasons but realistically like these animals reptiles are way smarter than we give them credit for they have yeah. much much more in-depth brains than we've ever given them credit for and um, they're individualized and exactly and and they yeah. they are they're individual they're not all the same thing and no. um yeah no there's yeah they did yeah um kind of okay so <laughs> so tell me a time when you saw your animal's behavior and whether it was a positive or negative and you changed something to, and then it became and how did like that make the animal and do you feel yeah actually um realistically the reason i started vivtech and the uv leds and the uva that's a big that kind of lines right up with that so through doing a lot of research um and and just on uv and i've always done research on uv and i've always told uh people to put uva and uvb on animals and i've always used the bulbs that say uva and uvb and i never really took the time to like really look at the bulbs and the, the wavelengths and see what the uva and uvb was and how it was used and eventually i now realize that most of those bulbs don't actually have usable uva um and not for the animals. So uh, knowing that UVA is affecting serotonin development in their brains and, and oxytocin, and it is, heck, affects so much of their endocrine system and how they feel and how they perceive their world and so much of that. And to know in that moment that we were depriving our animals, I thought I was doing a good job. I thought I was providing this UV lighting, but to know that we were de depriving them of that and that a lot of the behaviors we were seeing in captivity and we were justifying as brumation for bearded dragons or these animals just aren't that active when they get a little older or whatever you know especially beardies i always use them because they're such a good example of this but it's less that and it's more so that we there, there's massive imbalances in the hormones in their brain and they're literally almost almost i mean they really are living their life with what we would perceive as depression or seasonal depression and not crying yes. all the time and going through hormonal like my daughter's going through crazy hormonal changes and all that but like the lethargy and not wanting to like i deal with depression and I, when i'm depressed and i get into a funk i don't want to get off the couch i eat crappy food I, i'm not active and when i'm not active i have medical issues and i have bone issues and i have joint issues and you know so 
<laughs> so you, you gotta can, have you can't see oh, it right i guess but there is a diagonal two foot grow light over this tote in the back this is a four by two by two and then there's a three foot uh uvb in the back <sighs> yeah yeah you can see it a little better there yeah so that my animals are mentally and physically healthy because i actually take them for walks and stuff yeah and so they actually get sun whenever i can get it to them but yeah i didn't know this tech existed when i got that yep. it was april or so of 2021 i have an associates in physics so it's like oh well if they need if the sun's the best thing for them yep. then in uv's only providing the uvb then let's add a grow light so we get more of the spectrum here and i separated it out originally because of the the uh, the garden i can't get shit to grow here but when i was in kansas city i could the water's bullshit here. I actually, I tell people this apartment complex needs to be condemned. The Where the office is in this apartment complex is actually being condemned. Like, I'm not just like, oh, I'm mad. No, I, I lost two emerald green tree skinks because they got bacteria infections, we believe, because of the mold. That's rough. It's, it, yeah. And so, um, but... Even I've got video of my Emerald Lucky when he was alive moving back and forth from the grow light and the UVB because they were on each side of the heat lamp. And so he would actually move back and forth. I've had my bearded dragons actually bask under the, the grow light and not the UVB. They can get away yeah. from all of it if they want. I have multiple hides in there. Can... A lot of those animals can see both spectrums. They can see it. So they it's hard for us to understand with a lot of that stuff how it works for them because we can't even understand that they can perceive, they can see, pythons can see infrared, see yeah. visible light, the UVA, and some reptiles can even see UVB. So like, and how, and how people, how we figured that out was cutting open for the audience. They cut open the eyes because there is no atometry in veterinarian work so when you people talk about damaging oh this light damages the eyes you don't know what you're talking about because it doesn't exist in veterinarian it's not a real fucking thing it's not like it's it's super difficult to do optometry in veterinarian work would you not agree? Yeah, there's definitely it so, is. There's definitely a lot of really great research though on on what they're able to do and and yeah, studies and, and so they cut open the eyes after the animal dies and measure the cornea parts of it, and that's how they could tell what wavelengths and stuff they can actually see. Like it's it's yeah, that's how they do it. It's not, oh, well, this, this animal, oh, I guess they're starting to, to, to lose their eyesight. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> a lot of the more recent studies are not that, thankfully. Um, but unfortunately, because of the way that, they, 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 were, they thought for a long time that snakes couldn't see yeah. UV because they didn't have the proper cones and things like that. But then after doing uh, studies on animal behaviors under different lighting, they're able to understand where they can and can't detect it. And that's when they realized that they can see them. They were just looking at the wrong parts of the eye. And where I question your thinking, and I'm not actually questioning whether they can see it or not. I am questioning something because I've seen my bearded dragons go under the UV uh, A stuff, the actual grow lights, not on purpose. Mm -hmm. It was just they were just going through their gardens for the first time and realized that this actually does something. I think something that they feel is like us feeling something that goes up and down our spines, that, that tingling sensation. I think they're feeling that, and so then they start realizing that this is something, and then as that slowly goes away, I think they realize to move. 
I have I'm not that sure hypothesis. if it's a physical I'm not sure if it's a physical feeling, but they do that. That's what the parietal eye on the top of the, their head does yeah. and that, that hole. So there is some, some conscious regulation yeah. and, 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 and reception of it, but I don't know what the trigger is, but yeah, it could be something like that. It could be and something like when you don't, we don't feel well because we need something in our body. Like it could yeah. be something, who knows? Yeah. I think that's, I, I've just, uh, I've studied nonverbal human communication. And even Lori Torini has said she studied animal behavior and has been able to transfer that over to multiple animals because in the end, it's really like almost all of it is about comfort. Like that's really nonverbal is if you look at it as comfort and stop looking at it, is this lies? Is this not lies? Is this this, that? It's like, what part of the brain are they using? Well, you can still lie and use your memory. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's weird. So it's like, no, you can tell different things like that. It's fascinating. So I've seen my dragons like move and then go. You just see they like lift up and they just kind of like, oh, like this is different. Like something's different here. That was like the first time you get it added in. It's like just mm -hmm. that something's different here. And you could see that they, they register that. And it's yep. like, oh, OK. So I'm not just talking out my ass. I actually like, no, when I when I say this, I, I'm not. I actually try to be as honest as I can, even if it pisses people off. I try to, and it's it's a hypothesis, and there's no telling if if this is something that lasts because usually the tingling sensation that we have dies out a little bit, so eventually they have to realize that this is what we do. Yeah, like that, no, it would be really unfortunately until we figure out how to talk to them, we're never gonna know. Yeah, it's it's really interesting, and and there are ways that we could actually realize their communication. This is something I talked with Rex Colubrid. Um, when you actually try to hear your animals, they pick up on that. They pick up on, a, oh, this person's actually listening to me. And just like an actual person-to-person -person relationship, they seem to be less depressed and more open to the relationship when they feel heard. Like it's it's weird, but I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, I like it's, that. and that was one of the things that you actually talked about in that uh, curly haired uh, video about anthropomorphizing, and you talked about it as more of a positive. Well, there's there's a, as a, there's both sides to it. There's a there's a positive side to it, and there's a negative side to it. And the negative side to it is is. So everybody jumps on people for anthropomorphizing, saying that saying that any animal has feelings is anthropomorphizing, and that's complete crap. They're not stupid rocks, right? So first, first and foremost. But what anthropomorphizing is is when you have, let's say, the beardy mom that has a hammock that's made out of you know fabric and a pillow, and it's and then she's got her princess castle that the beardy loves, and its nails are painted, and it's on tile, and it it doesn't have all of the things that it really should have in order to be a successful, healthy animal. And it's more about them and the, just that, like, I, mean, I don't even know where I was going with that. I just get frustrated with that. Like that idea that that's, that's, good. that's okay. My question is how did you come to the conclusion that any anthropomorphizing was a good oh, so yeah so that's so that's the negative sorry that was that's where i was going with it <laughs> that's the negative anthropomorphizing so is is when you're taking it and you're adding like this animal loves this this animal loves my this other animal and you're not paying attention to the interactions between maybe a male and a female bearded dragon you think they love each other because you've made them a boy and a girl and now they're in love and that's negative anthropomorphizing because you're not paying attention to what your animal actually needs you're not paying attention through the eyes of the animals and how they're communicating to each other so that or or even you <coughs> so be and you're and you're putting your own projections of emotion on them <coughs> excuse me that's a negative the positive but but in because of the way that everyone takes anthropomorphizing is like putting any emotion on animal as people are starting to understand that these animals do actually feel 
things, they do feel things. Uh, whether exactly how they feel it and what it means to them and what it means to us and how we feel, I can't say. And I, none of us are going to be able to make those comparable or make a comparison. We can only uh, make a hypothesis based on chemicals and things like that of what it might be. But these animals do feel. So when you have people who are like, I love my animal, that and, and I, I feel like my animal, you know, is happy. And then people go, oh, you're anthropomorphizing. You can't say they're not happy. Like, no, when you're trying to do things for your animals, when you're trying to give them a feeling of what you would consider happiness, which would be putting a human emotion onto an animal, that's not a negative. That's not a negative when you're driving to make your animal comfortable and make its life better because you feel like that drives happiness or something like that. But it is, it is if you are not looking at it through the eyes of the animal at all. When you're not looking through biology eyes, when you're not looking through her So tell me how you came to that conclusion. How I came to that conclusion. Um, yep. Just seeing what everybody does, you know, seeing uh, the, the hobby un doesn't really understand anthropomorphizing and we act like it's any emotion. And then because of the past and how Reptiles have been seen as this emotionless rock, these prehistoric, driven by urges what, only kind what, of animals. What <laughs> age were you and were you talking to anybody about this that led you to this, this understanding? No, it's just I, I, I probably within the last five years of being out in the hobby and just talking to thousands of people and just kind of seeing how people react to their animals, how husbandry is changing, how people talk about their animals, like uh, even simple things like talking about my, my collection or my breeding facility versus my pets that I have at home and what the terminology is that makes a big difference in how people are, are, are communicating about their animals and their emotions and their feelings and empathy towards those animals and things like that. Um, and that shift is changing and I've seen a lot of that. So just kind of being out there and feeling it, I've seen that shift of people carrying it. And then on top of it, because reptiles have this, the people have this idea that they're prehistoric and driven only by their urges and whatever that they're, they don't, aren't thinking creatures. It's that, that, that we're there. People who put any emotion towards animals are being pushed away from that idea that it can be a thing. And it's complete asinine. They absolutely have emotions and think and feel. So I, I, I want people to be able to accept a little bit like, that anthropomorphism, realistically, it's almost not anthropomorphizing because you're really actually talking about an animal that can feel, but you're talking about it in a group of people who don't believe it can. Well, let's, let's, okay. So have you ever studied empathy? Not really. What does it mean to you when somebody says we need, we need people to empathize more? What does that mean? So I have a weird kind of feeling about empathy i think that empathy is a great philosophy but it's not ever achievable and as soon as people realize that like we'd be better off and i guess it's more in the definition of how people treat it and how i've always heard it but empathy is trying yeah. to put yourself in someone else's shoes right and a lot of times you get somebody who like let's say i had a friend whose mom passed away after an illness. My mom passed away after an illness. So I can empathize with him. I can appreciate that he's, I was sad and it hurt me. And I can assume that it hurt, probably hurts him. But too often we get stuck saying, I know how you feel. I know how you feel. I know how you feel and that's empathy. But realistically we don't, you never know how anybody feels. I know my buddy went through that. He lost his mom in a similar way to me. We both were about the same age when it happened in our life, same place in our lives, but our relationships with our moms were totally different, complicated things like that. So you can never, ever understand ever how someone feels. You can just understand how you feel you felt and then hope that they don't and then wish them, uh, you know, free of the pain that you felt. But it took me a long time, and recently I kind of stopped trying. I tried this last couple of years. I've tried to stop saying I know how you feel. And yeah, uh, I, I I don't say things like I can only imagine. I I imagine where you come from. I'm crying with you. Yep. I stopped trying to say that I completely understand what you're going through, but I'm not normal. 
I'm what you talk about as like your your brain works differently. Imagine yep. that tenfold. <laughs> That's me. That's not even a joke. Well, I like, can absolutely appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's different. There is nobody and nothing I can't truly empathize with, but I actually have studied. I have listened to the PhDs and listened to the studies and stuff. But going back to what my biggest problem is, reasons why I don't uh, show a lot of the, the studies that I've heard of, is I have issues refinding them. I spent years going, oh, well, I heard about this mosquito that actually they genetically engineered to for its offsprings to burst in larva state. And I literally spent, I listened on NPR, and when they released it into the wild, 96% of the area went down in mosquitoes. And it's like, and for years, I couldn't find it. I befriended I, I'm, I know lots of foreign people from college since I'm non-traditional. I'm not the biggest fan of American people always. I get along with the foreign people better. They just they, it's like they they have less ego seeming of the ego. I can, yep. And so it's this Brazilian girl I was talking to her five minutes. She gave me the study or an article on it. It's like it does exist, and this is why I come mm -hmm. across sometimes as an asshole, an egotistical asshole sometimes, and narcissistic a little bit, because I have to constantly reassure myself in those things, because I'm actually intelligent, and I question everything that I say. No, I and there's uh, multiple parts of empathy. When you're looking at it from a neurological standpoint, there's the modeling. If you yawn and I yawn... Which I don't actually do all the time, unless I'm tired. It's weird. It's really, really weird. I don't know if I've trained myself or if there's actually a damage to that part of my brain. I don't know, because the frontal lobe that comes in between 22 and 26 is your brake system. Have I trained myself so much from understanding empathy that I don't have as much modeling? Because I actually know what's going on. So I recognize it when I see it. When a girl, you know, copies my movements, she's focused on me. She's probably interested. It's one of those things. It's like, so you see these, these behaviors. And so when fish, we were talking with, I was talking with Rex Klubert and I was explaining this. When the fish move as a one, or we've seen the studies where the guy runs around the corner of the building and the people start taking off with him. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, oh, there's nothing. Like, what the hell? That's empathy. That's modeling. Animals have that. If you see mm -hmm. one thing running in the forest, there's other things running in the forest. That's a form of modeling that empathy but then we have the putting yourself in other people's shoes. And the part of that, my buddy hates me for saying this now. Something I've learned from this, that it's a bigger takeaway that I've learned from the study. is part of your imagination. And for those in the audience who would say, well, you're imagine And like, I think what his problem is, is imagination is fiction. Like you said, do you really understand or are you creating a fiction is almost your problem with it. And that's, but that's actually a part of empathy. Well, for the example that I would give how much, because something that you might take away from this study, but I'm not sold on it yet. Information is more important than empathy. How much information have we gotten wrong? May I? So then, and then the question is to you, how many people actually listen to you? I, I hear it over and over again. Mike Stefani, he's made videos. He tells you everything you need to do to socialize your monitor. Yeah. 
and people don't listen. They call him in a year and go, why is my monitor not socialized? Yep. Well, did you do this? No. Well, yeah. Why are they not listening to him? He has the knowledge. So then maybe using people's imagination might actually, there may not be wrong wrong way to look at that. But my, I've said it before, my biggest thing that I would say is uh, Mitch McCockey said it with the physics of the impossible. He's the, the physicist that looks like Shang Tsung from Mortal Kombat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, New York uh, State University, and his book, Physics of the Impossible, he says, we, uh, and it may be a quote from somebody else, but to know what's actually possible, you must step out into the impossible and take a step back. So some of the best ways to deal with this is to let them take it too far and then make sure that they have the knowledge to bring it back. These animals love us, uh, but they do bond with us. Yeah, absolutely. So it's like, so you're not wrong. And then, uh, so like something I want to do after this study is I would love to sit down with like you and some other people. And I want to bring in some sort of college person to oversee it. I have actually certificates in human studies to do a human trials. I had to do it for a nonverbal study I did in college yeah. with humans. I actually did one. So this, so, um, and so bring somebody in to oversee it. And then what, have you guys tea, like pull people off the street, have them fill out an entrance survey. And then, because this is conservation psychology and the lady's paperwork that the article, I think she's saying empathy or sympathy, not empathy, but she calls it empathy. And she says when they put up things that actually say, that actually describe these animals' behavior more human-like, people actually answered those questions on her survey more conservational friendly, which is interesting to me. So we could pull people off the street, have you guys do your regular teaching you know, do your regular thing that you would normally do because there's no real wrong way to do it. Is there a better way? That's what I want to learn. And it's okay. So then we do an exit survey for them. And then we pull another group off the street and then have them fill out the entrance survey. And then we teach in a format that would empathize these animals more to what humans do. Like yeah. uh, the fact that my, Peter Disney Say it again. Disneyfy them. Kind of in a way. I actually would like to do a. Um, I I I I'm more autistic than artistic, so so I'm really having issues trying to learn how to do animation. But I want to make like an like animated shorts. I yeah. want to lead people to the water. And then make them feel like like a like a mystery would where you're like I know I know where the ending of that that and then then but the person on TV doesn't so I'm like I uh, and so it makes you feel better to do yeah. that and this is what I preach like to people like this is what you need to do lead them to the water and let them figure out that like oh so if I have a person with a fever and they they're sitting in bed and they have a thermometer and then we scan to a Peter Bandit skink under a heat lamp during the day. Same thing, that, that Peter Bandit skink is trying to create a fever. And so we're anthropomorphizing, we're humanizing. So is that actually going to lead to people being more conservation friendly? So with the, the second study, you have them do the exit survey, but then in a year, we send them an email and have them fill out another survey, see how many people respond back at least. And right. then that, and so we see what sticks. And we see if that actually will stick more. Yeah. Because we don't know. Like, we're we're not seeing the... It, it does feel like we're getting somewhere in the hobby. 
and it's very interesting. So am I actually just studying the natural growth of the hobby or am I actually studying to improve it? That's a question in my mind of what yeah. I'm actually doing. And I don't think there's enough people who actually give a shit about the psychology of it. It's you need to listen to me. I'm right. I think there's that, more people than you think, but there's definitely... Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, when you actually talk to them in real life, it's totally different. Yeah. Now, I don't know if we want to go into, like, because that's, that's fascinating to me. And I almost want to put an asterisk by, because I don't see enough people so far. Out of everybody I've interviewed, about three people I could tell you that actually seemed like they were able to put themselves in the emotional state of their animal at all. Bill Stewart was not one. That's shocking for a therapist. Oh, yeah. Well, and he's amazing. Also, yeah. I mean, I love the guy to death. Like, he's, he's just absolutely a treasure. So yeah. when I say this, this isn't, oh, well, these, these people are bad because yeah. they can't do this. It's like, no. So this makes me question. So it would lead us to believe that information is more important than empathy in that manner. But is it? It will make a massive difference if you change who you're talking to. When you're talking to hobbyists, information is more important, and it's very difficult to get them to react to emotion. But when you talk to mom and kids and family pet owners and individual pet owners, it's the complete opposite. If you try and go after them with facts and, and, and logic, they glass over and think you're just hammering them. And if you go after them with emotion, you'll catch them. And see, that's, that's the interesting part. And is that actually accurate? And I think that's what I want to study afterwards. I think I want to see if that's actually true. And according yep. to the conservation psychologist, that is. That is 100% accurate. And so who makes all the money in uh, nonprofit organizations and what their commercials look like and yeah. look at H HSUS and why and PETA and ASPCA and all those animal rights groups that we're fighting all the time. None so we're, of sitting, we're sitting at 40 minutes. Are you OK to talk about lighting and uh, U.S. Arc or do we need to go to U.S. Arc? Um, I got about 15. I got to get out of here about 15 more minutes. I got to get. Okay. So then off. let's, let's go to Literally. us arc. Um, cool. they are, my problem with them is that there's people out there feel like the actual problems with us arc. Phil gross has actually said it. Okay. He actually comes out and says it like every, like I did an episode with silver and it's literally like, oh, well, he actually says it out loud. Nobody hears him. Like, actually, freaking, I've, I've seen episodes where he literally, he's like, yeah, we didn't do it by ourselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then it's like, you're not following up with that? Like, then you're not getting the full picture out to the audience. So one of the things that... And so one of the problems that I have with people is the idea of somebody else is going to save us. That mentality of somebody else will do it. Somebody else will save us. I don't have that mentality. There is no mentality of me. I'm doing this and I don't give a shit if you watch or don't. <laughs> and if you don't like it, I don't care because I'm actually contributing something. So you know what? I can stand up and say, hey, too bad. And we don't talk enough about leadership. When I have U.S. Arc Florida on, that'll be a bigger thing. One thing yeah. that people don't understand about U.S. Arc is that they do a fantastic job of finding laws that are be trying to be made. That's like that's unbelievably fantastic but they don't always go themselves. Oh, hold on. So this is the thing. U.S. Arc is one guy. It's Phil Goss. That's it. That's I thought, all thought he had a did. crew, like a little, nope. like a little crew. Nope. No crew. It's Phil. Then he does uh, a fantastic so job. There, that's the reason. U.S. Arc is we, let's, let me put it this way. The budget that U.S. Arc has, and this is not over, this is not over exaggerated at all. It's actually, it's actually, 
under exaggerated, but the budget that you the biggest budget US Arc has ever had for a year has never even come close to the stamps budget for the Humane Society of the United States. Their yeah, stamp not, budget. Not even, yeah. That's it. So that's what I'm saying. So while Phil, we would love to have somebody in every state watching and working with uh, the, the people at the state. In Wisconsin with the, the Herb Society, when I was up there, I did that. I personally took my time to go do that. I worked with senators, I talked to people, I spent an entire day that's walking it. the state capitol and doing that stuff, but that's what it is. It's that people are leaning too much on thinking that US ARC is going to save them. And US ARC is going to provide you with everything you need to help, but Phil cannot duplicate himself and try and be in Florida and then be at the in DC and then be in Texas and then be in Vegas and then be in California and then be in some little town in Wisconsin. He can't be everywhere. So we all need to start paying attention and realizing that we're all a part of this. Actually yeah. joining Herp Societies in person is a great thing, even though people don't like meeting in person anymore, but really creating a community and group of people in your local state is so damn important and taking the time and even taking vacation days to go talk to senators when you need to and go make those relationships but nobody wants to talk to a damn senator right but like phil he has everything i've ever needed i've messaged him and been like hey this is the this is the law i'm going after we have a conversation i'm like these are the talking points i need he helps tee up everything i need i can i write it up and run it past him he'll give you the thumbs up he can give you pre-written stuff he gets you all set with all the ammunition you need to be the tool to go help do this if he can't personally be there so that's one thing that like a lot of people need to realize there's a lot of people who are unsure about us arc and what it does and how they help us but us arc is one guy and one one lawsuit if we pick one lawsuit a year to fight that's almost their entire budget just yeah. one lawsuit that's not him going to shows and helping that's not him sleeping on someone's couch because he's trying not to use the budget while they're trying to fight a law he's come to wisconsin when we were up there to help us he flies in when he needs to like he, he well he let's get budget. into yeah. something a little different too is the fact that for me I'm seeing it more and more leadership is basically schoolyard rules. The person who's the loudest and the most yes. confident talks and everybody listens. I'm sorry. Usually that's the person who socially learned it and doesn't actually understand what the fuck they're talking about. Like, like I've got friends that do the entire country. It's ridiculous, yes. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So what should we – what picked you out? And like somebody – Bill Stewart also does it. What should we be looking for to actually have that in our local chapters? Because I don't even think most of the people – one of the things that I have done to solve this is I actually interview the herpetologist of states. Yeah. I've interviewed my own. So I'm contributing what I can. I'm doing something more. Absolutely. But we're not asking everybody to do this because not everybody's a leader. But we have lots of people that think they're leadership who are not. And we need to teach how to recognize real leaders, people that can walk in and actually talk to a senator. Yep. What would you recommend? That's fine. Um, honestly, a lot of it is it's it's your local herb community. It's finding somebody within the community that we, it can understand what to do, but find someone that has the confidence to do it. And a lot of times you're looking at people who his job is more public facing, who are more comfortable being in that position. Anybody who, you know, and, and that's kind of what you just got to do is it's every local community. Every state has a group of guys that, that are the guys that show up every, at every show. Everybody knows each other. You just need to get those people to talk more often and everybody to pay attention. Like all the people that show up at all your local shows in every state, you're all about the same 100, 200 people. Like we're all the same people at most states at the same shows. Like just start talking to each other. Just start communicating and, and, and you fight all you want. Argue and have egos and all that. But separate that from... Who, you like literally letting that come into the in, in into in between you losing your animals and your abilities and not like that's insane like don't like the guy but show up and fight when hit you know 
when there's a ban in someone's town or, you know, when the state's lining something up or be, you know, find the people who, you know, with the Madison Herb Society, when I started it, man, we had just, we were going to, we, we, we would print out flyers and print out, you know, uh, things to get people's signatures against federal things and go stand around at pet stores on the weekends and donate our time. And like, you just got to find people who are willing to do that. It's not easy, but when you find them, you just, I don't know, you take, you just, you have to, you have to love it. I don't know. It's hard to say. It's hard to find people who have that, who are willing to put everything out there and, and, and not get paid for it and not get recognition for it and not yeah. and sit around and continue to do it the right way and, and, and not get egos or get stupid about it. It's really difficult to find the right people, but when you find them, you got to keep yeah, them and, and one thing I would add to that is when you're actually looking for a leader, period, find the person that can recognize somebody else has talent. Yes, absolutely. If you cannot... Well, totally, there's two things that, like, for a good leader, one, they should be able to put together good people and find, you know, if I if I ask you to be, a, if, if you're a good leader, you should be able to put together a good team. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing, and, the, and you should be looking to build your team. Like, and... Yeah. The other thing I look for is somebody who doesn't have to tell me they're a leader. If yeah, you like that's. Me, you have to yeah. tell me how great you are. It's, it, you should. I, I then the, there's a reason you have to tell me because yeah, you don't have much depth. Yeah, and it's you know I when I started this and I interviewed Bill Stewart, I asked him to be a co-host because I knew he understood more of the subject than I did. When you recognize that, when you see other people, when you, and it is, and it's, and it's nice to be able to communicate with people. And I'm, I'm amazed at some of the, the greatness that I have met. Tarantula Collective. Oh my God. What a fantastic guy. Um, it's amazing. The, some of the people that you would think are leaders and you're like, after you meet them, you're like, yeah, I can see why people would think that, but that guy's not okay. A lot I of used, people care a lot more about themselves than the people yeah, around them. And while they feel I, uh, like looks, some people think that's leadership because they have, they have, they have cl like not even clouds or credibility, but they have popularity, popularity, yeah, charisma and popularity. And just that, yeah, it's, uh, there was a guy at a show that, that actually pissed me off because he overheard me. I was carrying around my Peter Bandit skinks at a show me show. He overheard me actually talk about him. I can sex Peter Bandit skinks by sight. How many people do you know can do that? <laughs> and he, he looked me in the eye when I was talking to these people about them. And so he started talking. I let him talk. This is a common, this might be a common mistake that people think about me is I like to talk a lot. When I had a politics class, I was the guy the teacher would go to for answers. But yet we would always wait to see if somebody else would answer it. Never, never wanted to be the first. It's that, and then if somebody answered it, I could come back with a retort. Like, I just, that's just part of who I am. And so this guy looks me in the eye as I'm talking. This is the part that pissed me off, is that he looked me in the fucking eye. And then he started in fine. I'm okay with that. I went to go try to find a bag to put my Peter Pan kinks in to get away from the light. Couldn't find one. Okay. So I go back in as I'm leaving. He stops me and says, make sure you get a bag of sand on your way home. And I've been through this so much that no matter how pissed off I am, my first response is a defensive one because my hand went up, but it's, I've got one in the car already. And I do actually, but that's, that wasn't even for them. Like I didn't yeah. even want to buy them originally. That wasn't the goal. It just, I, they had a female and it's like, yeah, let's get her. <laughs> right. So no, I, but I did have one in the car, but immediately I've already got it. And so I didn't want to start a fight. That's not what I'm trying to do, but that guy, and I, you've actually seen him. I know you've seen him. He's very loud. 
very kind of obnoxious, and he has been at the show. I know you might even know who he is, and that is not a leader. But that is somebody people will see as a leader. That is a first sign, and that sounds like great advice. But one thing that we don't recognize is 99% of advice given in the world is never given for the person taking the advice. It's given for the person giving the advice. And it's very rarely given up based on actual background. Neat. It's usually given off of what you've heard. Oh my God. The, uh, oh, I, got, I got into an argument on a Facebook group because a lady posted about uh, lighting. She's like, well, uh, my bulb went out. Can I put a red light in for my bearded dragons till I get my another light bulb? And so then the lady, the administrator, never asked a single question. It's a horrifying mistake. Never asked a single question. She immediately said, no, it'll damage their eyes. Just don't feed them. And I came back and said, that's a myth. Tell me how long it's going to take for you to get your light bulb. They came back. Well, it's it was either a Saturday or Sunday. The, they said, oh, well, the light bulb's supposed to be here Wednesday. We have no idea if that's going to come in Wednesday or not. It's like, so I said this. I said, okay, more than okay to do it for those three days. Do not keep it on at night. But you can go to Lowe's or uh, Home Depot and pick you up lighting. There's actually a box that, home, that Lowe's sells that actually makes them super cheap for 80-watt halogens. Yeah. Go do that if you can't. And then that another administrator came on and said that she's been doing this for so many years and she knows 20 year keepers and vets and I'm wrong and it'll damage the eyes. I came back and I said, show me a paper because there is no such thing as optometry in veterinarian. Plus the deals show that it's, not to use it at night. That's that was the main issue was they were using it at night. And of course, if you don't get sleep, your eyes are going to suffer too. So yeah, we expect there to be a little problems with their eyes if they don't get any sleep. And then this person should see a difference in their animal while this is being used at first because it should create a difference. And I understand why you would think this, but. This is incorrect, and I hope going forward we can work on this. But if you really believe this, show me a paper. And I got suspended from that group. Yep. The, the, I thought it was going to be for arguing with an administrator. This is the funniest shit ever. It was because they literally wrote, you were rude, and you were not willing to have a healthy debate. That is literally what they wrote. It was the funniest shit I'd ever heard. And the lady that actually like uh, suspended me, I seen the next line. She said everything to that lady that I had just said. Go yeah. to Lowe's and Home Depot and get the – like it's like I just did all your work for you because I was more than happy to ask a question. Right. I would love to have you back on. And let's talk about lighting. I your reptile lounge, uh, the retic lounge video is yeah. fantastic. Thanks, I man. was literally going to get into the lighting because I'm sorry to the biologists out there, but a biologist and a physicist are not equal when it comes to lighting. It's just not how that works. And as a scientist, they should know better. But I've got biologists trying to tell me about lighting, and it's like, no, take a step back there, buddy. Take just a little bit of a step back. That's why I didn't join the reptile lighting group, because the people that I met were like that. This is exactly how it – and then people would show messages from Dr. Barnes that actually said I was correct. And I even had one guy, well, I study under Dr. Barnes, and you're wrong. It's like, no, you're a biologist. I can tell you like this. Because I think in goals, not in absolutes. This is yeah. what I want to achieve. So how do we get there? I don't think in absolutes. That's a mistake. 
horrifying mistake. And that's what they were doing. And then when Dr. You'd see these messages and it's just wonderful. That's why I've never joined the reptile lighting group. And I hear it's fantastic. Dr. Barnes sounds fantastic. I think I'd get along famously with her and she worked with people. Mm -hmm. And these people out of that group owe me a freaking apology. And that's, they need to learn how to work with people. Otherwise they're just going to lose out because yep. my reptiles are physically and mentally healthy. And I didn't even know VizTech existed. I saw you. I would love to talk about, I even had it keyed up already to show the, the, the spectrums and uh, things like, uh, how if you've got two light bulbs because you actually showed that experiment and it creates two to three times more lighting than it should like than it would normally thing yeah. like that like we, we'll talk about that like i would love to bring you on just for that uh, i'm going to see about if i could uh, they stopped my email accounts the all email accounts for my previous college i okay. went to the university of I went to Crowder College, a little community college for physics, but I went to Crowder College, or that, no, I went to uh, Pitt State in Kansas, and I learned polymer chemistry focused on medical technology and stuff. I learned plastics and batteries and DNA and all that type of stuff. And so uh, I would love to get a hold of them and see about doing studies with your lighting to have them do that uh, up here. I would love to get with some of these colleges up here because the University of Washington is an absolute unbelievable. I think they're actually like 47th in the country or something for physics. Wow. Like they're to, to break the 100 and not be a, a like Stanford or something right. is super rare. So this is, and we would talk about physics and chemistry and to do all that because it's fascinating. I don't know if, because the talk of talk, I know I need to let you go. The talk of, uh, okay. is it tox, is it uh, venomous or is it poisonous is almost moot the animal's dangerous. Yep. But there might be something to be said for talking about the sun as radiation over heat. There may be some things that we can grow from actually making that distinction. Because I if you pull your yeah. yeah, if you pull your beard to drag, oh yeah, that's one of the things we I would love to see if this is actually a thing. If we could tell if the UVB is inappropriate for their enclosure by actually taking them out in the sun and measuring how long they stay dark and how much darker they get than they would normally get. So at some point, I want to do that. I found a small UVB track, like data logger that I technically could probably strap to a bearded dragon or something. But you'd, we'd have to do, you'd have to do it on wild animals. You'd have to, you would have to collect yeah. wild animals, do it. So maybe someday, but I'll have to talk to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> like, stuff locally, I think even in the U.S., maybe chuck wallows would be a good one. You because know, I've, I, I think that. I've saw it happen to my bearded dragons when I first got them. Pitch the bitch and Spike who passed away. Uh, I did not have appropriate lighting. The I made this enclosure. I got them the day before the Super Bowl when the Chiefs were supposed to play Tampa Bay. I don't know why we didn't have that one. I'm a Chiefs fan. I don't know why that Super Bowl didn't happen. I, 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 I don't understand. <laughs> and so uh, I made this enclosure in April because that was February 6th is when I got them. And I made this two-story enclosure and all this stuff in April of 2001. And I saw I was starting to take them out in March outside. Yeah. And I do see a massive difference yep. in how dark they get. And so I think it's correct. I actually think we what my first thought was for this study was to send out a survey and have people take pictures of their animals and what UV they're using and show us pictures of their animals 
outside and how long they were dark and how dark they get. We could also see how different morphs work and things like that. And I'm sure there'd be millions of people that would love to send in their pictures of their beardy dragons oh, and sure. being outside. And I think that's, that's one way to approach it. And that was my take because it's, it's like, I don't have the resources that everybody else does. Well, everybody loves citizen science. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing how how kept I've kept this study because I go overboard. The reason why that paper that I did for the that I did on a, I used a role playing game to teach interpersonal deception theory and how to hide your tales. And then halfway through the game, I used uh, the uh, I taught how to use group dynamics to overcome it. I use sociology and communication. That's a no no in in academia, so that'll never get published. No. So that's yeah, that's sad. But it is what it is. And I saw some interesting things. But that's – and so I don't have the resources like that. And I always wonder right. about you. And it sounds like you don't have as much resources as people would like to think. No, how, God, could we, no. how could we help with that? Well, the more uh, – the bigger VivTech go grows and the more people purchase our bulbs and support us, the more I can grow our catalog and grow the company. And we're not – I'm not growing VivTech to become some kind of millionaire. Like I just want to get big enough to do studies and put money into conservation. And that's where most of our money is going to go. So I, but I need to get big enough to do that. So that's really, that's yes. really it. And that was the, the retake lounge was a great video for that. Like you, I took that away. Um, I said that we don't see that the, before this, I said that we, I was wondering if you showed more empathy. So I want to, I want to step back at myself because I think you were a little different than the majority of people when you were talking about that. As I talked about that study, do you think the questions that I asked were appropriate when you actually take in for the empathy that I talked about, the different ones, so putting yourself in other people's shoes yeah. and like that? It's actually wildly appropriate, those questions, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't actually like the question that the lady, the conservation psychologist, put out. I think my questions were actually better, so we could actually see that. And so I feel like you did, but I don't feel like it was as different as I want to. But this also comes back to I know you, I've listened to you, and like yeah. most people, I actually am able to listen to people. <laughs> Unlike most people, like I actually take things away that most people will never be able to take away. And so that's why I'm not automatically including you in that, like into the three, but I'm not in necessarily including you with everybody else. All right. It's it's one of those weird things. It. Like, go, yeah. Yeah, let's, like I listened a couple times, come back to it, pass over. Yeah, like it's... Hard. Because we should be able to see people actually seeing through their animal's eyes, but we're not. We're seeing them see the animal through their eyes, and, like, this is what I see my animal doing instead of – actually, Keely from Three Sisters was one of them that – and this – I think her imagination comes from an abuse – from her past. And that was something she talked about on the show. Uh, Lady in Canada, Quebec. So just, one, of the, one of the things is you like, like really putting yourself in there. One of the things I guess I don't really even think about, but one time where I really do that, it's less on an emotional state, but one time, one of the ways that I really try and empathize with my animals in, in that regard is when I'm creating microclimates and understanding how to build their habitat. Like, okay, my animal wakes up and he's in his hide. Then he comes out. What does it see? What is it coming out to? Is it coming out to me on the glass like a big, bald, scary monkey? Or is it coming out to, you know, multiple layers that it can kind of wiggle through and, and judge where it wants to be? And how is it able to bask and feel comfortable? How can I 
let it see that not just how I see it, but how, how they see it when they come out and utilize those things. I have, I have a borescope so, uh, camera, Wi-Fi camera, and I run it down into holes and stuff and then court tubes. And I want to see how they're yeah. seeing it so that I can see if it makes sense from their perspective, even though to me, it looks cool. It might be totally stupid when you go into the tube and it's all jammed in each other and they can't even use it. So in that regard, yes, definitely. Yes. And Mike Safani, if I'm saying that right, he has a tragic backstory that, like Keeley, I'm wondering if that created more of an imagination with him since he doesn't have your background. And then that led him to actually... Since nobody watches this, I'm not really that worried that Mike Mike might see this and go. Even though he's he's like, I talk to him all the time now. He's an amazing guy, but nobody watches these things, and like, so I don't really know. But I would love to see if that, like, because of his past, if that's the actual thing, like that drove that would him. Be a think- really good conversation with Billy was Bill Stewart. You know, just yes. what he's seen with kids and trauma and things like that. That'd be an awesome. I actually, um, a young, uh, oh, I don't know if you know who uh, Natalie Reptile Room is. I don't know if I do. They're a YouTube channel where he brings his like five or six year old daughter okay. and actually talk about animals, talk about the reptiles. Oh, very cool. And it's, and it's not, he's not just parading her. As a prop, he is doing a prop, but she actually talks about it. So she's yeah. actually learning, and I love that. And I'm trying to do the episode with him and bring Bill on to talk about that childhood stuff. Like, what's what do you take yeah. like that? I'm so I'm trying to make that episode, like you're talking about. I'm trying <laughs> cool. to do that. Cool. I'm working on it, but Bill's just so busy. It's hard to get a hold. He's a hard to nail down guy. Yeah. Yeah. So no, uh, so no. I would the uh, guy I had on M ninety five genetics M ninety five. He was twenty four years old. The brake system is your frontal lobe, and the frontal lobe comes in between twenty two and twenty six. He said basically the same kind of things that I do, where I don't have full control of my mind, but I have control of my emotions and the more you control your emotions the more empathy you're supposed to get your brain's supposed to rewrite itself so if you have like an anger issue that you learn to control you'll have way more empathy than a normal person but then there's other things that go into an imagination being an only child things like that and so adding those two together is what happened to me and that's why I am so different. That's why this, like, I don't have full control over my brain, but yet I empathize with people that I, I would kill in their sleep, and I fully understand them. That's not even a joke. I, I would actually murder them in their sleep if I could and get away with it. And there, my, if I let my brain go off, it would come up with a way to do that. It, 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 I don't have control over my brain in that manner, <laughs> but I have control over my emotions. I get you. And M95 was almost the same way he was talking about. And I wonder if his frontal lobe is complete or not. And because that's why we see the uh, teenagers having more empathy in a way, like more for other people, because they don't have that break system. Mm-hmm. That me versus we. And so their brains are just going wild. And I wonder if that's why he was different. Could be. It's a very fascinating thing to think about. And these are things that we can work on if we're actually going to improve the hobby and increase it. Because I have people at work that actually know me as the lizard. <laughs> and it's yep. quite fascinating and they actually talk to me about lizards and stuff and they're okay with it they don't treat me like i'm a freak i get you yeah and most people don't but i have yeah. a boss my boss's boss didn't like me talking about reptiles so he doesn't think i'm appropriate for the job 
Mm-hmm. That's not a leader. That is a person who is not a leader because he said we were having a casual conversation. Fucking be honest. I'm not going to tell you to have a casual conversation with me and then get upset when you have a casual conversation with me. It's right. not the case. I know I need to let you go, but I, I want you back yeah. on and we'll just do lighting. Just start breaking shit down for the public. <laughs> and like, Sounds I mean, good, seriously, man. seriously break shit down because I have questions. Okay, man. I like it. Yeah, I do too. Sounds good. Hey, so what was the takeaway? What are some of the things that you think are the most things to take away from this interview or that you might have learned in this interview? Well, I think for most people, it's going to be that you empathy isn't bad as, as long as you understand the biology of your animal and what it really needs and what caring about that animal really means. And that, um, you know, you should always try and, and, and do the best you can for our animals and not just see them as rocks, but realistically look at how they utilize their habitat. And like you kind of said, kind of not just see it through their eyes, but like try to imagine how they use their life. Where do they want to find their food? How are you setting up their cage for them to sleep? feel safe and then explore and, you know, stretch their arms out and build their muscles and be the animals that they are, not just have them. So we, we talked about how to learn how to do that better. The possibility of how to do that better was some of the conversation. Okay. So audience tune in for that. And and (laughs) for the audience, Freaking put in comments what you think about Brian McVeigh or something. I'll I'll do some other shit here. But there you I, go. Everybody say how so crappy I am. Yeah. <laughs> Tell no, us absolutely. how ugly we are. Yeah. 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 Well, hey, but sorry, sorry I didn't have longer, but I appreciate it, man. I will talk to you again soon, but I gotta roll. Yeah. But, uh, you have a good night. Let's schedule that one for the lighting thing. Okay, sounds good, man. I'm I'm busy for a little bit, and I might be going back to work, so my schedule's going to get kind of crazy for a while, but we'll figure something out. Okay. All right, take care, man.